We're running right now? Yep. Okay, let's get out of this funk we got going here, boys. <clears throat> get up, drink your cup of ambition, and get on the road, boys. Get it cranking, Jay. Turn it up, boys. Like this, right? Get in a jog, going. Okay, so we don't get copyrighted there, but uh, yeah, I was list- I was listening to that um, during my morning fasted cardio. We got a lot to talk about today's episode. I think we're on episode forty nine, but here we're here with my coach, Sugar's coach, one of our uh, mentors, uh, Brandon Harris. He's been working with with us for years now. Um, he's really taught us how to breathe. He's uh, taught us a lot of how to meditate, how to be present in all our workouts. Um, a huge huge factor everyone knows it but on why sean's where he's at now and why i'm at where i'm at now and uh just a great mentor for us uh so glad you're here brother well hell yeah man i appreciate it. i'm humbled it means a lot to me because uh you guys have taught me a lot as well fuck yeah so this morning i woke up woke up come to the gym did about 30 minutes of nasal breathing cardio heart rate probably under 150 i didn't track it this time usually i do but i didn't um what is the benefits of that like 30 40 minutes of nasal breathing only cardio with your heart rate between 130 and 150 so i think the the easiest answer for that is that if you can stay nasal it's a good um objective way of knowing are you staying aerobic so now there is skill involved in that so i don't think it's a it's a pure pure equation but if you're somewhat conditioned and trained in nasal breathing because i do think that's a skill it it'll it'll give you a measurement if you're staying aerobic when you shift into an anaerobic state it becomes really really hard to stay nasal and at some point you're going to shift to mouth breathing so think of it as like nasal breathing is really good for you but there is a time and a place where using your mouth is good as well when your heart rate's up to 180 185 you need to slow it down so you need to get some breaths in right so yeah so a vo2 max test would be would be ideal right that's how we would know where that anaerobic threshold threshold is so where you shift from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism right so high heart rate anaerobic power all out that's going to be anaerobic you can only stay there for so long so for me because i practiced I practice nasal breathing a lot. Mm-hmm. You as well, Sean as well. If you were to jump on an assault bike and gradually build, when you can no longer maintain nasal, that probably tells you you're shifting anaerobic, mm-hmm. right? That CO2 is getting so big that you have to start moving more of it out and shift over to mouth breathing, you're going anaerobic. And you're only going to be able to maintain that for so long. So think of it like this is the practicing nasal breathing has all of these benefits it's it's beneficial for the mind you have uh you have uh the ability to create more nitric oxide vasodilation all of that it also is an indication if you're aerobic or anaerobic right so it's it has all of these benefits and and on top of that is practicing that so for an athlete for a bjj athlete for an mma athlete for anyone getting better at tolerating co2 will push that line up so you'll go anaerobic later that's that's a huge benefit so sean's in a fight his his threshold is high he doesn't have to shift over to anaerobic metabolism metabolism as fast as maybe someone else say a fat person that's getting on the treadmill they're fucking huffing and puffing and their heart rate's 100 beats yeah or 110 and they're going they can't even do it so they're Thresholds just they're love. completely out of shape. 
their tolerance for CO2 is really low. Mm -hmm. Uh, the chemoreceptors, their tolerance for that is just bad. They're just out of shape. So really for anyone, athletes, anyone, doing once, twice, even three times a week of 30 to 40 minutes nasal breathing only cardio would benefit them. Fuck yeah. It's probably the it's the lowest hanging fruit, I think. I think I think you first, above, above it all, is awareness. You know, we, we've talked about this, like just just awareness in general and having awareness of your body and having awareness of your breath, which is a huge piece of meditation and mindfulness, right? When you're when you're starting that journey, just the ability to be aware of your breath and feel it and to be able to be aware of your thoughts and separate that. That's huge. But the awareness of of the air coming in and out, I think, oversees everything. So for the majority of of people out there you want to get and even for people that are fit mm -hmm. because a lot of times like that again is a low-hanging fruit something they're not doing because think about in bjj like how often is your heart rate sitting around 130 probably not much at all right like it's for most people it's like sick 160 like it's a you're in that middle tier to that high tier so if you look at it as what you're not getting what you need what gap you want to fill Nasal breathing, lower heart rate, longer duration, uh, metabolizing fat, breaking down fat. That's probably one of the lowest hanging fruits that you can look at from a from a performance and a fitness standpoint. Yeah, that makes sense. Because you see Israel even. You watch his fights. Dude, he's nasal breathing in the fourth and fifth round. Yep. And he's big into the breathing and stuff. And same with Sean. Deep into the second round with Pedro, he's still nasal breathing. Sitting there focused, breathing out of his nose. Um Every time I do it, I mean, it's hard because you got to sit there and you're fucking bored. You got to sit there 30, 40 minutes. Yeah. Concentrate on your breath. I mean, it's hard, but the benefits obviously are fucking huge. But we could talk about breathing and shit all day. Let's run through the uh, the fights real quick from this weekend. Uh, we could start from the early prelims. I missed the early prelims. Um Jessica Clark, she got arm barred, broke her arm. That was it. That, so that ended up, it did become, an, it was a broken arm. Yeah. I, I saw yeah. on her Instagram, she's got to get surgery. So uh, Is the other girl, she, where's she? She's like, she was Russian or something, right? Yeah. Juju Storlanenko. Is she a, uh, is jujitsu, is that her? Story? I don't know. She's nine and seven. So I don't know if she's that great or she was, she, maybe she was eight and seven. But I know that Jessica Rose Clark, she likes hitting a lot of pads, and she's her main coach is a striking coach. So maybe she made a mistake. Maybe she's not doing enough jujitsu. Who knows? Who knows what happened there? She needs to get her ass out to Phoenix and see you, bro. Yeah, uh, <laughs> she's she's too hot. I don't want her around. <laughs> Jessica, I retired. She's fifteen ten. Macy Barber won that close fight. Uriah Hall, Andrew Munez. Andrew Munez was taken down pretty easy and ended up dominating that fight. Brad Tavares, um, and then Adricus. I think Brad Tavares won that fight. Ian Gary, 10-0 and now, beat Gabe Green. The Gabe Green kid seemed like super nice. His coach seemed super nice. He was in the back back uh, stage with us warming up, and I'm like, dude, he's asking his corner, say, kind of, what should I do to warm up? And they're like, uh, just shadow box, just shadow box. And, and then he's like, all right, what next? And they're like, oh, just shadow box again. And then they're holding pads, like unrealistic pads. They're holding pads by their head out here doing random combos. I'm like, God, that's unfortunate because you're in the highest level of fighting. You don't even know that maybe your coaches don't know that much. Or I always see a fighter and I see if I see their corner and all their corners are super fat and out of shape. I'm like, hmm. Right. They're learning from these guys how to fucking fight and how to be healthy like animals and they, they're not even living it. That's what I appreciate about you a lot is you preach eating healthy, you preach breathing, you preach meditation, you preach all this stuff and you live by it. Yeah. So it's not just a theory, which some coaches, it's just a theory. They, they preach all this stuff. They say they have all this knowledge, but, and they don't live it. I'm just like. Uh, well, you guys, you guys talk about there's levels. There's levels to everything, right? And there's levels if you're talking about a striker. There's levels in jiu-jitsu. Like, like we should always be trying to step up our game and whatever our our focus is. I think as a coach, like the best coach is is one that has 
the knowledge and has read the material or whatever it is, but also lives it. Mm-hmm. Like I, and I would choose someone that lives it over somebody that has the master's degree. I would mm-hmm. go that route first. Yeah. But somebody that has both and has studied the intellectual component of the game or the, the arts or the discipline, mm-hmm. but that lives it. Right. I mean, yeah. for you, like, would you agree with that? Would you go, if you had to choose, let's just say, go back and, and go the jujitsu route, somebody that has, I mean, there's material, I guess that studied it or somebody that practices it every day. Yeah. I mean, would I rather learn from a coach who's supposedly super knowledgeable, super smart, or would I rather learn from someone who can beat me up? Yeah. Who can tap me out, Show who you. can rough me up, who can wrestle me in and, and and put it on me. I want to learn from that guy. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think a lot too, UFC fighters don't make a lot of money. I mean, especially at the beginning, they don't make a lot of money. So they don't, they don't have money to pay a coach. That's why I think Sean's super lucky is like, I'm pretty much like fighting wise, only coaching him. Like I'm helping my other guys too, but the focus is mainly on him. And, yeah. and same for you when a lot of other people have, I mean, they have, different jobs they have their families that's kind of the least of their focus because they're not going to make any money off this guy yeah so it's the least of their focus yeah uh ian gary though 10 and 0 he looks like a he looks like a good prospect he he looked about six two long trains at a at a good uh gym uh i'm I'm curious to see him step up that'll be fun to watch him he's got a good energy too seems like a a fun like relaxed guy yep really cool uh cowboy versus jim miller cowboy was warming up in our hotel room and it was the first the they're tied at 23 wins a piece first one to or whoever won that fight would have the most wins in the ufc so that was kind of in the back i think cowboys like that a lot but it just seemed like fuck he didn't want to be there Seemed like I, he did not want to be there I and he agree. didn't want not want to fight. Like and I've heard him talk about it before, how how nervous and scared he is in the back room and during the walk and stuff. And it's pretty cool he can talk about that because everyone's kind of going through those emotions. But it really kind of seemed like fuck. Mm-hmm. I just want to get this over with. Well, so he, he retired, right? Yeah, he retired, yeah. which is good. I mean, when you have two kids too, he used to be Donald Cowboy, the crazy guy, who does all this shit. Maybe the the two kids kind of calmed him down down a bit. Um, he's always had money, so that it's not really an issue. Uh, it's probably, probably good for him to call up for a bit or for good. Uh, Jalen Turner, Brad Riddell. I, Jalen Turner's a nice kid. Uh, I've watched him fight in the past and I thought Brad Riddell was going to whoop him. I was like, fuck, Brad Riddell's going to come ready to go. He's here with all his boys. He's here with Volk. He's here with Izzy. Good, good camp. Uh, but dude. One mistake, especially with someone who with fucking long ass lanky arms, you take a shitty shot, you get cracked, you end up in a front headlock, and you pause for a second, you're going to be locked up in a Dars, you're going to be locked up in Anaconda, you're going to be locked up in a, a guillotine. I think uh, Jalen Turner ended up finishing him in a mounted guillotine. It was like thirty seconds in, right? Yeah, big that, win, big win for him. Dude's long for one fifty five. He's super long. It's like six yeah. three, six four, right? Yeah, it's a big. Long dude. Yeah, it's a lanky motherfucker. Yeah. And then uh, we, we got Sean and Pedro. First fight. Man, that place was fucking loud for the first fight of the night. You, dude, most fights I've been to where it's the first fight of the night of the pay-per-view, it's still kind of empty. Yeah. The crowd's not there really until the co-main and main, but this place was pumping for sugar um, for that one. Warm-up was good. Uh, the whole week was good. I mean, we... We had a nice hotel. Usually we're in this locked up hotel with suites. We can't really go anywhere. We have a small weight room. We can't drive anywhere. And I kind of like that because everyone's around. You have nothing else to focus on, but just like focus on the weight and focus on the cut. This time we went to Red Rock. Uh, The hotel wasn't that great. So we went to Zooks. Zooks took care of us, got everyone pretty much sweets got you guys a room got everyone sweets really fucking hooked it up yeah but now they had now there's a lot of shit we can do we can leave we can go to the rolex store we can go do interviews at other places uh we can go eat wherever we want so there's a lot of all over the place and uh tank kind of mentioned that he's like yeah maybe with all this stuff but you also said he's like sean's the type that can handle that and i agree if anybody would know it's you and i think and i think sean I think Sean would be honest. Like, 
I honestly don't think any of that from a distraction standpoint affect his focus or his performance. And I think yeah. he's unique in that he is so mentally good. I think other people probably couldn't. Like yeah. that would be a distraction. But yeah, yeah. you would you would know, you know? Well, and, and like I told you in the motel room, it's like he's very disciplined with his meditation. Mm. And if you're super disciplined with your meditation and in a, in, and at any moment, anywhere, anytime, you can bring yourself right where you're at and focus on exactly what you're doing. Like that's a fucking real superpower. Mm. Especially fighting. Especially when you have people betting a quarter million dollars on you, like Steve will do it. Yeah. And you have all these people and you have all these plans after the fight and all these celebrities, these superstars with millions and millions of followers are there to watch you and they're betting big money on you. Yeah. Um, and, and then he puts himself right in the moment and he's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's definitely a, a gamer like that. But again, that confidence obviously comes from his preparation and being able to put himself in the moment when you got 30, 25,000, however many people fucking screaming at you and a lot of pressure. So it's super impressive that that he can do that. Yeah, it was it, it was cool. Chris Pratt, right? The the uh, dude from Jurassic Park and mm -hmm. that actor, he was there to see Sean. I just actually just started watching this. There's a new Amazon series where he's like a, a, a Navy SEAL. It's actually a really good series. So that was cool. Kind of cool to see him there. Yeah. And then, like you said, man, that that place was full. The celebrities were there early to start that card because of Sean. Yeah. Which was really cool to, to see and feel. Yeah, it's cool. And and the UFC higher ups see it. They see what's going on. So it's uh it's a good. Uh so the fight, uh I just still I'm like, I just don't think Pedro's such a fucking tough guy. He's had so many tough fights. It's hard for me to kind of believe that he wanted a way out, but also I'm like, he's very smart. He, I mean he's he's been around this game a long time. He's very smart. So maybe he, yeah, that right hand did close his eye. Maybe the left hand did kind of scratch his eye a little bit. And he's like, fuck, this is my time. This is my time to not take the L on this match because I can't really see that great from the right hand he hit me with, first of all. Yep. And maybe he did scratch the other eye a little bit. So this is my time because he didn't take the full five minutes. You watch him, he didn't even kind of try to open his eye a little bit. So... In a way, it was just a super tactical, probably a smart decision by him because through the sparring, Sean sparred a lot of new newer guys that he hasn't sparred before this fight camp. And in about five, six minutes after the first round or whatever, he figures them out. He figures them out and he starts landing fucking clean shots. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like that, I mean, that was going to happen later on in that fight and especially how good of uh, shape Sean was he's going to be able to turn it up in the third round and start really piecing him the fuck up uh what it felt like to me too like purely from an energy standpoint and being there like there was a breaking point early in the first round where it felt like Pedro's energy demeanor shifted and I think it was it might have been that right that caught him and I think it was before that that cheap kick that he said got him in the groin, which didn't seem like it did. And it was almost like Sean's speed and his ability to, to keep Pedro at distance, like just kind of threw him off. And at that point, that seemed like to me, it played into that. Like you said, like a business decision mm -hmm. at that point, he's like, fuck, like, like almost like he got broken away, which from a guy that is world-class and has been in there, with some of the best in the world, to me, that shows, that really does show Sean's skill. Yeah. His strength, his speed. Yeah, and the level he's at. And he, Pedro, after the fight, Pedro's a super nice guy, like tons of respect for him. Uh, he even said, he's like, God, I'm so sorry. He's like, that kid's going to be champion. He's so tough. He he, he said that to me right yeah. after the fight. Um, but, I mean, I think they came out there thinking, I'm going to be able to kick the fuck out of this guy's leg. Yeah. Pedro's known for his calf kicks. I've talked to training partners from American Top Team. They're like, he's known for the calf kick guy. So he came out there and kicked Sean with his best shots, and Sean checked him, checked him, checked him, ate a few. And I think he's like, fuck, this motherfucker's still here, and he's yeah. checking those kicks. And he previously he had a foot injury. That's why the fight didn't happen in Phoenix. And he checked a few of those kicks right on that foot. Is it the, do we know is it his right foot? I don't know which yeah. foot it was, but he checked some fucking hard kicks. Yeah. If you never had a check, uh, kick checked, 
It seriously fucking hurts. But it's good to know now that those judges scored that first round for Pedro that you can just touch the legs with your toes and that's going to be a significant strike. I learned from a, a world champion in Muay Thai, uh, Fabiano Cyclone. He, he used to kind of show me you can use the front of your foot, your lead leg, and just smack their thigh with your foot. Just smack it. It's almost like a jab. It's not going to do any damage. Point, but to point. the judges, it is because it's smacking, and it's not hurting. Um, so that's a, one thing we're going to definitely implement because Sean was checking those kicks. That should be considered a strike for him because it hurts Pedro. But those judges, who knows what the fuck they know. They probably don't know shit. So they're like, oh, he kicked him, kicked him in his knee. That's going to be a point for him. and so Because I think they said 28 kicks landed or something. I'm like, there's no fucking way, dude. There's no way. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, what's next? I kind of talked about that on Patreon, what I think's next. I don't know. I, I don't know. We could. We had that little fucker, Henry, calling him out. But I think Henry just wants to stay relevant. I don't know if he wants to fight again. He went back there. Started talking shit, started calling people out. I don't, I think he just, like, he's, he's got such a big ego that if people aren't talking about him, he, it just burns him. He's just trying to keep his name in, I th in, in it's, the, it kind of seems like it. But I'm like, if that Henry fight happened, okay, first of all, that'd be a pretty fucking big fight. But Sean's in it right now. He's fighting. He's ready to go. He's training. He's, he's ready to go. Sean has a, very dangerous front headlock that people don't know about if henry takes some shitty shots sean's gonna like i said wrap him in a guillotine anaconda dars his wrestling's just improving sean doesn't get lucky knocking people out henry's gotten lucky throwing a couple overhand rights on tj cutting to 125 uh early stoppage on dom sean calculated hits motherfuckers on the chin both sides boom and just floors them boom not just not lucky shots if I think Henry would have a hell of a time trying to take Sean down. Henry has pretty good boxing, which still, may, hopefully he's confident with the boxing, so he tries to stand up with Sean. But still, a big cage, Henry's going to have a tough time cutting off Sean and taking him down. And if he does take him down, Sean's got a very offensive guard. Very offensive guard. He doesn't just sit there and guard and get his fucking ass beat. He's getting angles on you, throwing homo platas, throwing triangles, up kicking you. He's making you work. So... I don't think Henry would take that fight. I truly don't. He knows how much uh, attention Sean has on him, so I think that's why he did that. But for me, I'm like, dude, let's f let's do it. Like, you'll beat that little fucker. He's fat. He's got a gut. He just he he's not really training. He thinks he's really cool. But uh, we'll see. Like mm -hmm. I said, we'll see. I don't know if the rematch with Pedro will happen. I just gotta, we just got to sit down for a couple weeks and uh, kind of just think about it. He's yeah. healthy. Sean's healthy. Yeah, he's that's, healthy. I mean, that's a that's a positive from the week the weekend, right? UFC's coming back to Vegas in September, mm. so I guess we'll see how the uh, Cheeto, yeah, Cheeto and Dominic fight goes, and we'll kind of, we'll we'll see what happens. Do you think that even though we had a a round and a half, and to me, like it, it just seemed like Sean was dictating everything, right? Like besides the points, do you think that'll change? Does that does that change the perspective from say a Henry or some of these other fighters of Sean? Does it play into that or does it not? Or do you think these guys like the shit that they talk is all just fucking shit talk? Like these guys respect Sean, uh -huh. but do you think that that round and a half does that sway people? Do people look at it and say like, okay, you can't just kick him, like you can't? Does it change yeah. the opinions of some of these fighters or, or some of these announcers? The guys that maybe weren't on, like, that believed in him? Yeah. In him or yeah, I think it ups the stock more because everyone's like, oh, man. Because the Cheeto kick, obviously. But everyone thinks, kick his legs a couple times. Thomas right. Almeida didn't do it. He couldn't get in range to do right. it. But Pedro did. He kicked him. I think he kicked 35 times or something in the fight. Uh, I think that opens a lot of people's eyes like, fuck, okay, now I can't just kick the guy. Yeah. He doesn't have soft shins. He doesn't have soft legs. Um, yeah, so we'll see. I, I kind of I did a breakdown on Patreon kind of of the fight and what I really think is next. I don't want to talk about it too much, but it's on Patreon. Uh, and then next was Robbie Lawler versus Brian Barberina. The week prior, I had Bri Brian Barberina on the, on the podcast, and it's a good one. You kind of learn about him and his life. He's on a farm. He has 100 animals. 
with his wife and his three kids and he's been one of my good friends for a long time a fucking great dude and southpaw and southpaw robbie lawler was piecing him up i was like fuck but dude brian barina is so goddamn durable he's tough huh? so durable and brian comes back and tko's the former world champion at 170 that was so sweet so happy for him his family got a bonus uh so fucking sweet dude um sean stricken versus pahara oh he got fucking floored dude i mean he got smoked he, and, and sean stricken parries a lot of punches and swats at a lot of punches like this and pair have pahara feigned a little jab came around with a left hook think wobbled him and then smoked him with that right hand pahara versus israel is gonna be sweet mm -hmm. that's the that, that's the fight right that's yeah, what has to happen. which is pretty crazy. But someone was saying, I or I saw someone on Instagram that Perhera weighed two hundred and twelve pounds. I think it said so one eighty six to two twelve in one night. That's a lot of fucking weight. Mm -hmm. Volk versus uh, Holloway, a war. I mean, we were just getting back to the room, so I didn't get to really watch it that close. But damn, that trilogy is over. Volkanovski pieced him up pretty good. And then Israel, Jared, I mean, Jared did good. Jared, I mean, he fought a good fight. He could have took a little bit more risk, but it's so easy for people to say, oh, take more risks. You take more risks on a good calculated striker like that, you're going to get be face first fucking lit up. Yeah. So you can't really take a lot of risks, but Jared did really good. Stayed tough for five rounds, won a couple rounds. Um, it'd be sweet if they did Jared Sean Strickland next. That would be really sweet. So, I don't know. Uh, after the fight, we went to the uh, the Zook nightclub. And it was all right. I mean, we went out with uh, Kyle, Nelk Boys, and Sean. And it's like, you, you keep, when you're with the, like stars like that, you go to a table and everyone is just like staring at the table. So, you can't really let loose. I mean, it's kind of uncomfortable for me. But we had a good time. Uh, the girls had a good time. We got a buzz. But like I said, with those clubs, it's like I get there and I'm like, ugh. It's just I'm waiting to leave. Unless you are unless you have an opportunity to flirt with some chicks. We struck out. Mariah struck out. We all struck out on the chicks that weekend. Um, but it was still a, a good time. Not quite as fun as if we're celebrating a clean KO. But still, Sean's healthy, and I don't think it does anything to his stock. So I got a question for you. I saw that the uh, pool party, you had the uh, Liver King there. Yeah. What was the, what was homie? What was he talking about? What was he cool, good dude? Like he was. Yeah. Reeked of bo, which is cool. No deodorant. No, he said fuck no. He was, he was <laughs> like, why would I wear a deodorant? You know what's in that shit? You got to enjoy your own smells. Yeah. It was, but he, he, he super he fan of sugar. Yeah. It was pretty cool. That's cool. But that motherfucker's yoked. Yeah. Like his abs are his big as your head yeah i i i like i mean I, I like the dude i follow him online i don't think there's any way he's natural you know? uh i mean no <laughs> but he says he, he he says he is that, i mean you got to right you say that if, if you're selling a supplement you yeah, got to say i guess but i mean i, I mean i'm in the, that space and to me that's a little dirty yeah yeah because you, sure. got, you got kids that think like that's what you can look like by just training hard. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't think Dude. so, but who knows? I could be wrong. I want to I want to go out there and, and take to his house and uh, do a pod with him and stuff, but the sick. motherfucker was yoked. Dude. Yeah. His back, every muscle in his back, his legs were just veining out. Yeah. And, yeah, they never shower with soap, him and his wife. They just uh, do water. But he was he was a nice guy. Yeah, it seems like he's wanting to spread a good good message. Whole Foods, but yeah. <laughs> what did, would you know his story? Like before he was the, he, he's had some other successful businesses, right? Is that I don't know his story. I'd be interested in that. Like this yeah, Liver King thing is more recent, right? I'd be interested too. So yep. hopefully we can go out there for the, and do a Timbo Sugar Show pot with him, and we'll ask him about it. But so. I heard from someone, it was an article, so who knows if those are true or not, but he makes like two mil a month from his supplements. Good for him. Which is like, you got to, yeah, keep running it. But there's just, I mean, can you look like that eating just 
food. I mean, just natural food, chicken and rice. Not not chicken and rice, but just fucking raw food. Get that jacked. Without, Is it possible without synthetic with just crazy I work ethic? I don't think so. But I don't. I don't know. I mean, I'm biased. Like I've never taken anything, and I'm. You know, I mean, I, don't, I look a certain way. Obviously, genetics play into it. Yeah. I think I do think if you've spent a lot of your life and you understand progressive overload and you understand specificity and you bulk like there's strategic bulking and getting stronger and you're doing it and then you know i think you can definitely get big yeah but to me it's there's a different look it's like uh <laughs> okay say like uh usman mm -hmm. that dude's jacked he also probably has like some of the best genetics you're ever gonna get yeah black yeah yeah like there's a look right like like that's a machine he's a machine mm -hmm. and his genetics is probably as an example the best you're gonna get now he's a fighter so he doesn't need to get like what would his body look if he was trying to be a bodybuilder he could get bigger yeah still has a different look mm -hmm. but i don't know that's not my that's not my specialization so i don't know i mean seeing the liver king and stuff online i'm like ah Maybe probably not, but in real life, I'm like, no, no, dude, he's fucking more Jack than any bodybuilder I've ever seen. And is he, he's in his forties, right? I'm not sure. I would think, but he was a super nice guy. Yeah. Like I said, I feel like the message he's trying to spread is just be more natural, be more holistic, which is a, a good message. I think I'll love. Yeah. I'll love for the, yeah, game. I was thinking about it. People like people that are really into politics like really into it like politics is their life say someone like ben shapiro or something i wonder if they're ever just truly relaxed and able to be just kind of mindful and just be present and happy or is their mind just burning about politics something that they're all the time i'm always curious about that you ever watch ben shapiro yeah he's good i like i like him too i think he's good i, I mean I, yeah i think you have to be so strategic in that space it's like um you know i'm sure there are really good people that have devoted their life to, to politics but i think i think it it's hard because of the strategy there's so many layers of complexity to that mm -hmm. like it's you know it's just fucking way too much for me to, to comprehend but at the same time i can appreciate and respect that like there's layers like money power go way back like to be able to understand how that all comes together i just know thank you like for me i want i don't want to be strategic in my relationships i want to be sincere authentic i want people like you around me that i can just not have to like plan my moves right to say i want to impress this or you know i want to do this to influence them mm -hmm. So I'm grateful I'm not in politics, right? Yeah. Yeah, for real. Because I'm like, fuck, how it would be hard to shut your mind off. I always think about that, too, with, like, people who are lawyers or people who are, like, uh, investigative agents. Like, can they ever shut their minds off? Do they go home and they have a switch or, like, I can shut it off and I'm not there? Or are they always trying to think? Because I'd be miserable. I'd be like, you're living in fucking hell, dude, for me. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the arts of practicing mindfulness and meditation is this idea of uh there's different types of awareness and focused awareness would be a big piece so choosing where you're where you're aware so i think people that are really like that operate in that space that are still have some kind of peace is they're able to transition basically they're whatever it is they've decided to focus on they're there so you know, you're, you run a huge company and you're, you know, you have to be able to, to dedicate your time to different things. And then you go home and it's okay. I'm shifting my attention or my awareness to my kids mm -hmm. or my wife. Right. Like, I mean, that's, that's a huge skill for real. Right. So awareness and meditation isn't just, isn't just the goal of not thinking it's being aware of your thinking and being able to direct it to whatever you want could be on the breath. It could be on this conversation. It could be on a work, you know, right? It could be anything you want, but the ability to tune in to what you choose is a huge piece of that. Yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine how many divorces are because of that. Yeah, they make good money. They have a nice big house, but the husband or the wife comes home and they don't know how to shut it off. Yeah. And they can't be there with their kids. They can't be there with their wife and, and enjoy the things that they have to offer. Right. They're just minds going. 
and yeah. then it ends up in a divorce. Yeah, and they, th- I think you probably end up with a lot of situations where they, that's that's the way they think it should be, because they make money. Therefore, you know, right? Like that's my role. My yeah. role is to be the provider and make the money, and you should just do your, you know, like that's okay. It's yeah. not like if you care about your relationship. You should care about the other, that other person and their, your time with them, right? But yeah. I think a lot of times in our society, in our in our culture, money is such a, you know, like that's the priority yeah. that people put it above everything else. The reality is you can make really good money, make tons of money and still be a good husband or a good partner, good friend. Yeah. Again, can you shift? Yeah. Can you shut it off? Yeah. And then some of those husbands that are like, look at the house you live in or look at the car you drive. Yeah. And the woman's like, yeah, but you don't hang out with me. Or right. You don't fucking love me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you've been dating Chelsea for how long now? Two years, actually. We met two years ago, almost to the day. Damn. Yeah. So it's, it's weird that I remember July 7th, 2020 is when we met. And the coolest part about that is I think I've told you this, but so she boxes, she loves MMA. She lived in Spain for a year and a half and she was boxing there. And prior to that, she, so she studied like sports journalism and she did a study on concussions or she did a story on concussions. And so she was interviewing people at the lab. So she met hot sauce. She met Courtney Casey, right? So she, she found you guys through that, I believe. And was a fan of you guys. And she heard me on the podcast. That's oh, how that's, we met. That's crazy. So she reached, she messaged you? Yeah. I think she messaged you and Sean. And oh. I, I was kidding with her. I'm like, yeah, I'm the least popular. So that's why I messaged you back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or maybe because I, you know, I mean, I, that's kind of, that was a joke. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, she messaged me and she was looking for coaches and um, she came into the gym and yeah, two, that's two, crazy, two years dude. ago to the day. That's awesome. So, because what's the, she's pretty young, right? Yeah, she is like 15 years, like almost, almost 15 years younger. So I bet that's kind of different being like, and you're, you'd be the one to do it to try to just look at everything kind of from her perspective or what age she was at. Because yeah, if I hang out with someone 15 years younger than me, I'm like, damn, they're young. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's a case by case thing. And I think, I think women tend to be more mature earlier. Um, I think a big part of it is that we have a ton in common, but it's so, it's interesting. Like it's, it's like how you look at it and like, like I've had to learn to not overthink it and literally just look at it like, man, we, we have so much fun together. I've learned so much from her. I really have. Like I've learned a lot about letting go, being more present, not overthinking, not judging from her, how to, how to just like tune in at, in a different way and not overthink the fact that there's that age difference. I mean, and I think, and I, and I try to understand what it would be like for her too. You know, I know like, but at the end of the day, it's, we have a, we have an amazing relationship. We have really good communication. We have fun. Like, it's like, why overthink it? Yeah, I mean, I feel like with an age difference like that, I mean, you're so open-minded, and I think it would be hard when there's age differences like that if the one of the persons wasn't. Right. Just like, I, uh, no, it's this way, it's this way, it's this way. And I would be curious to test your biological age because you're probably younger than most 28, 27-year-olds yeah. health-wise. Yeah, I'd like to think so. I mean, I think um, – I, I think that's a piece of it. I think, like you said, being open-minded and then looking at it from a conditioning standpoint. Like, why why is that? Like, why would some people think that couldn't work? And I think a huge piece of it is just society and conditioning. And, like, you then you look at it like, okay, traditionally you probably have the male that's older that is looking for a younger partner just because of what it represents, mm-hmm. Right. That's not me at all. Like Mm -hmm. I could give a shit about that. Like Chelsea's a beautiful, she's a beautiful woman, but it's, it's really about, yeah, I'm physically attracted to her, but we just, it was a cool relationship. Mm -hmm. But you know what I'm saying? Like, it's more like the person that might say like, whoa, like why? Like, because somebody told you that can't work. Yeah. I mean, and it's one thing if like, if I was 30 and she was 15, that doesn't like, that's, you know, like she's not legal. She's not ready. She's not ready. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. 
at 27, she'll be 27. And I'm, so I kid too. Is like, I'm just going to keep saying I'm 40. Yeah. Like I'm going to stay 40 until she's over 30. And then if I'm lucky enough to still be with her and then it, the gap is closing. Yeah. It's like, after you're over 40, who cares? Yeah, like exactly. until you're 50. Yeah. And when you're, you know, younger, it's like, so yeah, it's cool. We have a cool, a cool thing. I'm lucky, you know? Yeah. You guys fucking got a cool relationship. That's pretty awesome. So, uh, I guess the Tesla bots are coming out soon. Everyone. Uh, if you had, if it said, say 10 grand, say they started at 10 grand and this bot does all your dishes and does all your laundry and does all your vacuuming. Are you scooping it? I haven't thought about that. There's something that freaks me out about that. And it's probably like the Terminator, you know, type yeah. of, but there's also this side of me that, that like appreciates doing things, right? Like, like the value of doing the dishes from mm -hmm. a standpoint of like learning to be present. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I, I probably would like, to be honest, like if it's not going to attack me and they're not going to take over the world, like mm -hmm. I probably would get one. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I mean, I've kind of got to the place too where I've, I'm like, okay, just do the dishes and don't mind doing the dishes. Turn yep. on some tunes, take a little smoke, smoke, and yeah. just have fun doing them. But I think when you have kids, it'll probably change. Like, fuck, I don't want to do these dishes. Yeah. Fuck, I don't want to do all this laundry uh, and all this shit. So I, I'm, I would definitely probably get one if it's just like does shit like that. And then, yeah, I don't know. Because if it, if it frees you up, there's so much value. Yeah. If you can read or train or exercise, like, you know, take a walk. Like there's a ton of value in freeing up your time. So yeah, that's that. They're that close on that, right? Yeah, th yeah. three months. I don't know if it does like the chores and all that shit, but um, yeah, but dude, it's going to be crazy. I mean, you could you could verbally abuse that thing if you wanted to. We, we do live in a crazy time like right now with the progression in technology and it's only going to exponentially increase. Like it's, it's pretty wild. I mean, I guess we're lucky. Well, they were talking about, about this uh, this Google engineer saying, um, it's this video, saying chatbot has developed like feelings and sentiment. I sentiment, heard about that. Sentiment means a view or attitude towards a situation or event or opinion. See, that's where it's like, oh, fuck. Uh, they start having feelings and they start having their own. Ugh. That's where it gets a little bit scary. Terminator. But a little Tesla bot to do my chores, sure. Yeah. Put a little wig on it, get a little HJ once in a while. <laughs> Jay would. Jay, did you get bored on the trip? Uh, I mean, just like when I was just in my hotel, I was just watching YouTube, that's it. Yeah. But J it was chill. Were you watching YouTube just on your computer or phone? On my computer, yeah. I was just watching like... That dude, Big Doss, his pranks and shit are pretty funny. Yeah. Well, fuck. I should probably go to Patreon. On Patreon, we got a bunch of some questions here. I like Jay's style, though, man. You're one of my favorites, bro. He's laid back. He it's keeps chill. it real. Dude, yep. there's, some, there's a lot of depth to that <laughs> dude, man. Yeah. He's a, he's an artist. I, I enjoy our time. You could do anything with Jay, and it's just going to be a chill time. You could go. You don't have to worry about fucking entertaining him. It's, uh, it's good. Real good. Uh, okay, here we go. So Patreon, you sh remember guys, I'm on Patreon all the time. I'm doing a solo pod a week. Um, Ryan and I, sometimes just me answering all the questions. Um, I did a, some video blogs of the UFC fight behind the scenes for Patreon. What does it cost to be on your Patreon? Uh, five or ten dollars, and then there's some higher tiers too that get you I mean, more shit. Think about that too. The ability to have contact with a world class coach, interact. That's priceless. And I mean, I'm not, I'm being serious. Yeah, yeah. Like th that's, what's cool. Technology is the ability to, to actually have a interaction with somebody that's world-class. Like you can't put a price tag on that. Yeah. Fuck. That's awesome. Thanks dude. And, yeah, and on the Patreon too, I don't mind spilling the more beans on other shit and stuff because it's just a, a group of guys that are, are cool. So here's Esteban RT Ortiz. Hey Brandon, currently going through a breakup and I seem not to be able to think about anything else and it's affecting my overall mood. Any advice how to begin meditation or breathing techniques because it's very easy to get lost in your head and overwhelmed at all times. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think the the again the key is awareness is everything. So uh uh you know, insight meditation where you're just focused on the breath is the starting point 
and I know you guys have chat, talked about it a lot, but I think if you're if you're looking for guidance on that, there's do an app. Um, you know, have, there's tons of apps out there. I think the Sam Harris app is really good. What's the one that was like first that everybody headspace? headspace. Like you have to be consistent. That's you have to. It seems like it's such a like I think when people meditate, they get so stuck on this idea that it, they're going to feel better. When the reality is you're actually probably going to go through a phase where you feel worse because you're learning to tune in to your feelings, but you have to be consistent with it. But the consistency could be literally, you know, five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day. And you, you do that for long enough. You will gain an awareness and insight that is priceless going back to that. And that's, you have to start that. You have to be aware. What's your morning routine like? What time you wake up and then what do you, what do you do to get going? I get up so early that, that I don't, I, okay, I get up and I walk my dog. So, you know, I've, I've been out of a house now for um, for a little over a year. So that changed things up a little bit. But I my dog holds me accountable to getting moving. So I get up, a lot of times I get up at like 4.30, 4.45. Um, I get up, I'm kind of half asleep. I make my coffee or sometimes I just do espresso. You, uh, How do you make your coffee? Yeah. I do a pour over. I do Kim X. Nice. Yeah. So I did like that. I enjoy, I enjoy that process. I'm doing that. And, and then I get my dog up and I take her out. Ideally I'm doing a 20 minute walk with her. Um, it's not always, but I, the goal is 20 minutes and I, and I practice, uh, awareness. So for me, just the slowing down the inhale and the exhale, being aware of the breath, no music. I don't take my phone and just having that having that space to slow into the day is really important and then i'm cruising up to the gym and and uh you know getting what's getting your go-to on. breakfast i don't eat when i get up that early so i'll fa- i'll fast I, ch- I don't really follow like for me I'll, I'll fast on days where i have morning clients and if i don't then i'll eat i'll eat and i tend to eat I actually found out recently that I'm allergic to eggs. So that used to be kind of like an egg, avocado, turkey, bacon, bacon thing. Now I've moved away from that. So um, I've been doing smoothies. Um, I'll still do like avocado, avocado just by itself with a little salt and pepper. But yeah. How did you find out you're allergic to eggs? I did the, I did the blood test. Mm. Yeah. And it came back with foods to avoid? Yep. Yeah. Damn. So... Yeah, like, you know, Sean does with uh, with Gardner. I think that the the value in that is you have somebody that's super educated and we talked about and understands the relationship and the connection and all of that. I didn't I didn't necessarily get that, but I was able to see what I was allergic to. So I had a pretty significant allergy to wheat and then dairy was on there and then um, eggs as well. But like all my stuff came back great. All my mm-hmm. hormones are great. So, and I, in before that, I, I, every time I drank a beer, I do enjoy a good beer and I would feel congested. So it makes sense that wheat, like any wheat beer just mm. Fs me up. Any simple exercises for neck pain? Simple exercises for neck pain. I mean, it's always complicated. There's never a right answer, yeah. but I think just simple neck circles. I would go there, right? Like some would call it a neck car. And not like all the way back or all the way back. Yeah, you could. I just wouldn't move into pain. Okay. So I would think about it. Imagine you could imagine that you, so you want to create a little bit of tension. So imagine that you were like, you were in something that had some, um, like some density to it. So like jello or something, if you were buried in jello and you could breathe and you had to move your head in, right? Like where it's not just flopping, but you're actually just controlling, you know, 10 circles controlled with breath, go the other way. That could be a simple, a, a simple answer. Don't move into pain, and then you could apply isos as well, isometric. So, so you could find the angles that create pain, and then stay just shy of it and push into something, mm. right? So you could use your ha- your hand, or you could use like a band or something, right? So isometrics are a, a, are a safer way to start as well. Yeah, you had me doing that. Some of that stuff yeah, with the shoulder is right. good. Uh, Logan Penhollow. Who are some trainers or coaches that you take inspiration from or try to learn more from? You talk about Paul Check all the time. With, you know, I know you guys are connected with him. 
um, I go way back following his stuff and reading his stuff back to when I was a rookie trainer just out of college. Um, there is, uh, I think there's a system called PRI, the Postural Restoration Institute. And I have tried to dive into a lot, a lot of their material. So if you are a, a young coach, a, a trainer, I think looking into their stuff because they understand the um, the importance of breathing and how breathing influences movement. And that's overlooked a lot. I would say the majority of strength coaches don't have a good appreciation for how breathing affects your ability to move. So if you can marry a good understanding of strength and conditioning and progressive adaptation and overload with an understanding of um, of how air pressure influences your ability to move, that's the fucking, that's what you want. Money. Fuck yeah. Uh, you've told me multiple times that most, I mean, martial artists or people who fought for a long time will probably have shit going on in their shoulders or their rotator cuffs. Uh, Wyatt says, when it comes to shoulder injuries like shoulder impingement and rotator cuff tears, how does one handle the situation? Can focusing on range of motion and imbalances allow someone to regain regular strength and range of motion without surgery? Again, these kind of questions are hard to answer because everyone's so different, right? Yeah, I mean, I hesitate to give up like I have the answer yeah. because I don't think anybody does, mm -hmm. right? But hearing that, okay, it's like, has there, have you had it, have you had it MRI? Like, do you know what's going on? How bad is the tear? But let's just say that it's not that bad and surgery isn't needed. Could balancing out uh, structural balance, it been, yeah, hundred percent. And I think too, again, how you breathe, like when we look at the shoulder. So the basic idea with this is that when you take a breath in, every bone in your body is affected. When you take a breath out, every bone in your body is affected. Think of the rib cage, it changes shape. Right, so your scapulas, they have to glide on your rib cage. So if somebody is compressed through their upper back, which most of us are, that's going to affect the scapula's ability to move. Okay, the scapula can't glide. You raise your arm overhead, it's going to affect the the joint. Right. So the scapula, a good healthy shoulder, the scapula needs to move. Right, upper rotation, downward rotation, protraction, like it, it's fluid. It doesn't, there's no connection on the back. It just glides. The rib cage is smashed and compressed. So somebody that's like chest up, like their rib cage is up, they're stuck in extension. Their scapulas are going to be stuck. So again, I would go back to the dude that's having shoulder issues. Can he drive air into his upper back? Can he get an expanded upper back so that the scapula can glide? That's almost always neglected. Like, PTs, chiros, doctors, like you don't, people aren't talking about that. So get air into your upper back, expand that part of your body, see if it changes how the shoulder feels. I mean, we, we talk about it like, like you don't want to, you don't want to be stuck with your shoulders if you're trying to be athletic. Mm -hmm. Like who, like what expression of power ever looks like the shoulder blades are, are stuck back? So a coach or a trainer giving you the cue of pulling your shoulder blades back is probably not the appropriate cue. There's a there's a mis there's a misunderstanding of how that works. You'll be stronger in that position. A classic power lifter bench press, you'll be able to move more weight, right? But but you better be careful if you're if you need to express movement athletically, and that's the only strategy you use when you're in the gym if that's if that makes sense to people it's like when i walk into a gym everybody is typically biased in compression they're stuck back and then they're gonna go do jujitsu or they're gonna you know right like even just walking requires movement and fluidity so there's a big mismatch there people mm -hmm. are restricting their fluidity in the gym and then they're asking their bodies to be dynamic and fluid and to be able to express movement yeah. So right, and they're like, "Well, I went to school for it." It's like, "Yeah, well, maybe some of that info is outdated, and they're not willing to change it." Yeah, you just—it's like, uh, it's an—it's interesting, man. That like it's missed. I'm telling you, how breathing influences your ability to move is just not—it's missed. Now, I think because breathing is becoming more popular, you're gonna start to see move a movement of people that are not only using breathing to influence the mind and work with the mind and our nervous system and calm down, you're going to see it. You, you, 
you know, quote me here on this. You're going to see more coaches and trainers talk about breathing and how it influences movement, how it influences training and exercises, I hope. So, yeah, it's missed. Like, I didn't learn about that in college. It's a post-college, I'll way further, like. Digging in. Yeah, like, wow. Like, and now looking at it, it makes so much sense. Yeah. But I can go back when it didn't. And I'm like, you know, I understand that it's like, I'm saying this, and some people are like, what the fuck is this dude talking about? It's just our, the way we breathe influences our ability to move. Most of us want to be fluid, unless you're a power lifter, right? Unless you're lifting at this gym over here, and you're that's your primary goal, everybody should be should tweak the way they lift with that understanding. That's perfect. Cooper Giblin, what challenges do you face working in a country that we're rewards things like sleep in for the, for the week or that kind of corporate grind currently working marketing and sales and those who get rewarded in the office tend to do unhealthy things yeah i mean fuck that's probably tough what do you what do you think on that one yeah, it's, there's there's a ton of there's a ton of conditioning. There's a ton of I'm, I'm assuming he's saying like kind of the grind mentality, right? Be the first one into the office and or sleep for a week, sleep in for the week. Yeah, that I'm confused there. I'm confused too because yeah. you spelled week W E A K. Sleep, or sleeping like, in is yeah, for the week. It's for the week. Okay, yeah, like people that stay up late working all. The time. Sometimes I feel like that. I mean, some sleeping in. I sometimes I sleep in, but I I I know what things make me fucking feel good. And I feel like I know what things to do to make me feel creative and make me feel good and make me have good energy. Yeah. I think he's talking about like the people that say sleep is for the week, like the people that, yeah, yeah. Oh, not like, sleeping in, but people that, um, you just grind, grind, yeah. like yeah. don't care about sleep. Fuck so your health. What he's saying. Fuck your health. Grind. Yeah. Basically. I mean, there's going to, I feel like with those kind of people, there's going to be an end to it. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with working hard, right? Like, look at you. You've got this new gym. You got like you've worked hard. You've earned it. But there's a there's still a balance that can be had, and that balance depends on what you want. Like, you're not gonna you're not gonna become world class at anything without working hard. But that doesn't necessarily mean you've got to drink seven Red Bulls a day. And like, yeah, it might mean you you know you you're sacrificing other aspects of your life your social life it might you might be sacrificing not going out so that you can be healthy and and push the grind like i think there is definitely a balance and that balance line depends on what you want to achieve because you're again you're not going to be world class by by being lazy yeah. but that doesn't mean you have to be unhealthy either right and i think that's the that that's the line is like the dude that's grinding in sales or whatever and he's fucking still partying four nights a week and he's maybe he's using drugs and he's drinking red bulls like that dude is going to burn out but the person that prioritizes sleep prioritizes healthy relationships understands what they value understands what they want to be good at gets up at can get up at 4 30 in the morning and, and still be healthy you know so i think that to me is how i would perceive that is like know what you want to be great at and then prioritize health right yeah and, and occasionally then, go fucking you know get after it like that's nothing wrong with that either like kind of form your habits around for sure. what you're trying to do that almanac of naval ravikant if you uh, Cooper, get that book. That book's fucking good because it talks about money and it talks about all those type of things that you're asking. Really good. Yeah. Um, suit rags. Hey, hey, suit rag says, "Hey friends, while growing your business, what hurdles did you experience and how did you overcome them?" I, for me, I mean, I've had, I have so many friends and people that have businesses that I've been able to get advice from, so I, I didn't have to like just make all those mistakes and figure it out on my own. I, I still did, and there's still hard things. But one thing that I I did, I think that helped out a lot, is just started really small. I didn't start with the gym I have now, with all this nice equipment, with all these brand new mats, with all this nice stuff. I started with some older wrestling mats, older shitty wrestling mats that I got an offer up, renting a mechanic shop that was 900 bucks a month. That wasn't hard to really get the rent. I mean, I had a couple students for a while. I wasn't making any, any money. 
I was just doing it, which I didn't mind doing it because I love martial arts and I love jujitsu and I love teaching people too. So it wasn't really hard for me because I didn't hate doing it, but I started really small and then I didn't go big. I went a little bigger, a little bigger with a, a little bit more money um, coming in. And then I went a, a little bigger now. So I think starting small and just kind of gradually building kind of helped me avoid a lot of those big setbacks that other businesses have. Like if I had a big ass place when COVID hit and now it's like, I got to shut down the gym. It's like, maybe I would have been really fucking stressful. That's why I don't want to ever get so big that if something happens, I'm fucked. I'm like, Oh fuck. Now I got to shut down. I don't ever really want to get that big. Yeah. I don't know. It's going to be hard to navigate though. Cause people are going to keep wanting to sign up and keep doing this. So I still just figuring it out. Yeah. I admire too. I've told you this is how you've created a community. You guys have done a really good job. And you, you, you know, you've done that like with the people you have around you, and it's like you guys. There's a family, and I and I think that's that's really really cool. And I know there was some some good foresight like with the podcast and just being able to be authentic to who you are. That I think is really cool, and I think you know, pat yourself on the back for that. But I but I agree. I think it's you know. For me, the same thing. Like I didn't, we didn't, you know, we didn't take out loans. Like I've had a gym for twelve years, um, so we didn't, we didn't get, we didn't get. Uh, what's the? I'm trying to think of what's the saying. Like our, our head too far in the water, or whatever that is. Like we took deep, our, yeah. yeah, we took our time. We took our time, but I think it's key to key if you have a passion for something and you want to be good at it, you just yeah. keep getting better. I think that's it too, because I've been around gyms that they open it to make money. Yeah. They're opening it. They're getting out fat loans, 170 grand. We're going to build out this. It's going to be top of the line. It's sick. We're making money, but they don't just really just love just doing what they're doing. They're just trying to make money and I've seen them just go under. Yeah. And same for you. huh? So you guys, you just saved up a little bit of money and you started with your business partner and you guys just yeah. got cruising. He, he, he's a little bit older. So he had, he had a little bit more start. So I borrowed from him so that we went in 50-50. Mm -hmm. um, I had some savings and we just, we do, we bought stuff on uh, eBay and Craigslist and, um, and just found stuff. And then, you know, looking at it now, like we don't, you know, we owe nothing. We never did. So it's cool. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Never any big struggles that you've had to go through where you're just like, fuck. People were tricky, man. I remember talking to you about this and how, you know, it's like you, you take care of the people around you. And that's, I do think that's, that's huge is the people that you value and that are valuable for your organization or business, you know, you take care of them. Um, but I think people are hard. Like it's, it's hard managing people is rough and it's, you know, I think there's a lot of people that they're just people just looking for a job, right? They're not, yeah. you know, they want to show up. And so I find that the most difficult part, I think, especially because I'm not a, I'm not the type of person that wants to micromanage or be a hard ass. Yeah. So looking at it now, finding the right people and understanding how to interview and ask the right questions, I think is huge when you're looking for uh, people to fill roles, and, uh, like know what you need and then not just, throw somebody, you know, they're somebody that's really good at sales and you're asking them to be a teacher or a coach that might not be with, right? Like, yeah. you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've been lucky. I have such good, like, I guess you could call it employees, but just my friends that help me run this place. JX, so reliable, loves jujitsu. And I really try to treat them really good. Yeah. Pay them more than, they're, than I'm supposed to pay them and just like make them feel good because... I, I don't know. I, I feel like I've done a good job at that, but I'm super lucky to have Jakar and Courtney who've trained their whole life in mixed martial arts. And now they're teaching the am amateur program here and they do so good at it. Like top to bottom, building a group, building a community, does everything at the gym. I can trust them. Same with Jay, same, same with Johnny, uh, Art and Mariah who teach the kids. I'm super lucky to have good employees that were just all like good friends and growing it together. That's yeah, pretty sweet um logan says what's up boys just really been on being grateful and appreciating myself recently i'm wondering what are you most proud of yourself for hmm. i don't know that's a fucking good question because i wouldn't say i'm proud of myself for doing what i'm doing because i i don't i'm not i'm doing it because i fucking like it 
Yeah. That's the reason I'm doing it. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I would, where my mind goes initially with that is being proud of the the effort and desire to grow. Like, I think, I think that's a, I think that's a, like a, a, a person that is living a reflected life. That's constantly looking at themselves honestly and saying, where do I want to get better? And doesn't view that as that's a negative thing or that's a weak thing, but that's actually a strength that can admit their weakness. And that took me a bit to figure that out. So my advice for people there is to learn that admitting what you're not good at or admitting your weakness or being able to um, to admit your fear, it's power because that's how you grow. When you deny those things and you repress them and you pretend like they don't exist, like you don't get anywhere. Mm-hmm. And I think especially males in our culture, we, we, we tend to, that's harder for us to do. But I think that just reflecting, journaling, right? writing and understanding where do you want the type of person who do you want to be and being honest and working i think that i you know be proud of that yeah so yeah now that i think about it, i would say i'm proud of the discipline i have if i if i say say i want to do something then i yeah try to like make my habits so i can do that and i'm proud of the discipline i have i'd say yeah um, Austin, are the benefits of a sauna worth paying second gym membership because the gym I train at doesn't have one? I'm paying an extra thirty dollars a month just to use a sauna at another gym. What do you say? Depends on your financial situation. I would say, like, first, if the money, if you could remove the money, yeah, I think it's great. I think I, I don't know all of the research on on heat exposure, but I know there's some there's some really good health benefits. Uh, he shot proteins and all that. I think it's mental. I think like that mental, what you get from from mentally pushing yourself, whether it's cold or whether it's hot, there's a ton of value there in learning to move towards something that's uncomfortable. I look at it that way. Like I hate cold. And I'm, you know, I tend to be like, that's a harder thing for me to practice. But I really think what it teaches you is to move towards something that's uncomfortable. And then go back to what we just we just talked about. Like that can teach you to move towards emotion. It's uncomfortable. Anxiety, stress, fear. Like actually move towards it. Accept it. Mm-hmm. Getting in a, a sauna and it's fucking uncomfortable and sitting there for 20 minutes, you can you can feel something. I think cold and hot on top of all of the other health benefits. So if it makes sense financially, do it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, moving towards that uncomfortable type shit. I'm trying to. I'm trying to get because I have a guy who trains here with with me. He's a sheriff of the SWAT team. Yeah. Big dude. You can tell he's just a badass dude. I'm trying to. I want to teach more of the Phoenix SWAT team how to fight and yeah. how to be comfortable when shit gets kind of hairy. Oh yeah. Because I mean, cops. I wonder what kind of training they go through to be like okay. This guy's really disrespecting you, or this guy did something and not let your emotions just go boom and flare up and kind of black out and do some dumb shit, just staying calm and thinking about what the be- next best move is. Yeah. Well, we think SWAT is a higher level than your typical cop. Yeah. I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You would hope so. I mean, you know. Yeah, I'm sure it is too. Yeah. Uh, this is probably a harder uh, question to answer, but it just says, what are the best exercises to do every day? breathe just a good breathing I, protocol yeah, i fucking would start there i really would you know i would i would um if that's if i pick one thing breath awareness i would start there i think that that's you know and then obviously this person is probably talking about exercise so that's a much harder question because i do think it's specific so you probably look at compound low a lower body compound exercise if i was going to but there's a lot of skill involved in that. There's, but yeah, give me, give me one breathing, go breathing, breath yeah. awareness. Cause Dakota, we don't know if you're 500 pounds sitting there in a chair right now, or we don't know if you're a 150 pound athlete your whole yeah. life. So it's hard to answer. Context matters. Uh, last one here before the cameras die. And then, uh, Brian Nixon would love to hear Brandon's opinion on body weight training in yoga. I mainly do yoga type workouts now and wondered what a professional like him thinks of them. They can be great. I think one of the issues that could present itself in yoga is a uh, pushing people into potentially more of compression, so an extension like bias practice. 
which could be an issue. It also might not be. So if you love it and it's mentally, it's, it's good for you. Fuck do it. Right. But if I was looking at like, if I was, if I was sitting down with somebody that practices yoga all the time that has like chronic back or hip issues, I might say, well, you're, you know, you're probably extending too much. So like, I'm always going to say there's no right answer. I think yoga is amazing. I think it's a, you know, mental can be mentally, mentally very beneficial, um, can be great for the right person and maybe for everybody if there's a good balance hopefully that helps i mean yeah that's that, that's perfect that makes sense but uh that's all we got folks i mean we could talk i feel like i could talk to brandon for hours and hours so we'll have him on again in the future thanks so much for coming on appreciate dude. yeah thank you homie you the fucking man uh yeah check out the more content patreon.com slash red hawk academy um to support the show if not like and subscribe if you don't mind okay guys see you next week peace, peace. Peter, gonna in, I'm gonna throw